am so want to do. All right, guys, this uh, lecture is good times, bad times, period from 1920 to 1932, when everything goes from being, hey, we're awesome, to what the, the politics of prosperity. Guys, during this time, we have a whole lot of new needs to look at, like highways, prohibition, immigration. We have new choices, like what are we gonna do about evolution? about declining farm prices, about transportation, and we have new realities, like a total disappearance of the progressives like we had under Wilson. You ready? Now, Harding's failed presidency. <coughs> Harding had undoubtedly the most corrupt administration in American presidential history. Now, he seemed on the part of the president. I mean, he was handsome, charismatic, but he was most comfortable uh, in back cigar smoke filled rooms playing poker. Um, he and his administration gave out hundreds of uh, government jobs. He died on August 2nd, 1923, when a blood vessel in his brain burst. And with his death, it's like, all of a sudden, all this junk gets unleashed. Like his interior secretary, Fall, uh, he leased out the oil reserves at the Teapot Dome scandal, or at Teapot Dome, Wyoming, taking huge bribes from companies to steal America's oil. Yeah, like his secretary, Harry Doherty, and others sold a government land at way below value. And as head of the Veterans Bureau, stole more than $200 million from the government. I mean, three of his cabinet member go, members go to jail. One, I mean, five commit suicide. And then in 1927, his mistress published a tell-all book. Scandalous. So the three-way election of 1924, basically the Republicans choose Calvin Coolidge, who was uh, Harding's vice president, as their presidential candidate. The Democrats, they split. The Northern Democrats really like Al Smith. Who is Al Smith? He was the son of, son of immigrants, Italian. Uh, he was the New York governor, very reform-minded. Meanwhile, the Southern Democrats, they wanted to appoint an executive from one of the Teapot Dome companies, but instead uh, got John W. Davis, who had served in Wilson's cabinet. And the trick card comes out with the progressive socialists that chose John LaFolia as their presidential candidate. And these guys are socialists. And what's interesting about them is LaFolia was the first presidential candidate that was supported by the American Federation of Labor, or the AFL. Indeed, LaFolia and what he stood for scared the Republicans so much that they claimed that the key issue in this election was if America would allow itself to be degraded into a communist or socialistic state or whether it was going to remain American. Coolidge wins then with 16 million votes or 54 of the pop 54 percent of the popular vote. Up here you see the electoral vote is actually much greater, 77 percent. You all got it? So keep it cool with Cal. That was his election slogan. What did he stand for? He stood for limited government. Basically, he's the guy who said the business of America is business. And he believed that free markets and the free operation of business 
would sustain economic prosperity for all. Kind of like if you remember Trump went in and he removed a whole lot of regulations that some argued were stifling business. Now, if you're for free markets and the free operation, you have very little sympathy for farmers. Because it's kind of like, have you ever had a friend who had a job, like maybe this summer you'll have a friend who has a job, and they'll always say, I don't get paid enough. Man, I don't get paid enough. They're not giving me as many hours. Well, after you hear that for about four weekends, you're like, well, get a better job. Well, that's kind of like how we felt about the farmers. Even though they're having to compete with people that have uh, economic levels way below us. Anyway, the McNary Hohen bill had been barely squeezed through Congress. Basically, that gave some farm subsidies and supports that barely passed through. Only get to Coolidge's desk where he vetoes it. If you're all about business, he gets the wealthiest man in the nation, Andrew Mellon, to be the Secretary of the Treasury. His Secretary of State, uh, Herbert Hoover, kind of warned him, and he thought, hey man, we need to start regulating the credit that's being used out there. But Coolidge totally refused. Basically, he put competent businessmen in government positions and stacked the court with pro-business judges, kind of like we do here in Texas. You know, ready? The diplomacy of prosperity. Okay, we kind of had two things we were dealing with at this time. One was um, Wilson's international isolationism. So we want to be isolated from everybody else, but we want to expand our markets across the world. Like, we don't even get into the Treaty of Versailles that ended the war with all the European nations. Instead, we signed separate peace treaties with both Germany and Austria. Meanwhile, American companies that weren't devastated by World War I continue to outproduce and outtrade the rest of the world. I mean, America is responsible for 30% of the world's trade. American companies produce 70% of the world's oil. American companies produce 50% of the world's coal and steel. into the Middle East and Asia was limited, other areas proved very, very useful. The United States and Latin America. Now the Monroe Doctrine, American investments, our control of the Panama Canal, and armed intervention made us very active in Latin America. Indeed, in 1921, the year Harding entered office, we had troops in Panama, Haiti, the Dominican Republic, and Nicaragua. And Harding, of course, promises that he's going to pull out the troops, but it's going to be very slow. Why? I mean, we had troops in Germany until 1980. 
Uh, we had troops in the Philippines from our victory in the Spanish American War until 1946. We still have troops in Japan. We got sure troops in Afghanistan. To make sure that they don't revert back to their own place. Yeah, because basically, guys, they're getting a whole new government. And you want to create an environment where that government can basically prosper. So it's slow, and we want to ensure control over the finances, like in both the Dominican Republic and Haiti. But I think we'll get to that next slide. And we train their troops uh, at the US National Guard. But true to our word, we pull out of the Dominican Republic in 1924, Nicaragua in 1932, Haiti in 1934, even though in the Dominican Republic and um, Haiti basically to appease the European country, banks that had loaned them a lot of money, we said, hey, we'll keep control of their custom houses and their import tax revenue, so you'll continue to get paid back on those loans. And what do we leave? We leave an incredibly improved infrastructure, kind of like in Iraq. We uh, rebuilt the road system. We put in water lines. We gave them an electrical grid, top of the line. But we did very little else. I mean, we don't improve their standard of living. We don't uh, set up an educational system. Why don't we do that? Well, whose job is it? It's their job. It's their job. Kind of like, guys, are your parents going to pay for your college? Or hopefully you'll be able to get uh, scholarships or loans or something like that, right? So let's say that everybody's here, their parents pay for their college. That's what the American Army's done. It's giving you the groundwork. Okay, you can go to college. Who's responsible to make the grades? Y'all are. If you don't make the grades, you're the one who messed up your own life. And guys, please, your first semester of college, do not lose your head. Remember, you're there for school. Have fun, but remember. Now, of course, because America's America, um, sometimes we'd support stable dictators if a democracy would be too insecure. For example, Rafael Trujillo, who was a dictator of the Dominican Republic, uh, he remained in power until his death in 1961. And in Nicaragua, we had originally sent in troops under Taft in 1916. They left in 1925, only to come back the very next year because the Civil War was ripping the nation apart. Um, in 1927, most of the rebellion was put under. There was just one little section left uh, of rebels led by a guy by the name of Augusto Sandino. And um, we pull out our troops. The president invites Sandino to the presidential palace for dinner. Sandino goes because they think they're going to talk about peace. Well, in actuality, it was a trap and he gets executed, uh, which causes his followers that take his name and form the Sandinistas. They basically continue the fight against the government until the 1980s. Ready for the next slide? All right, commercial expansion. We have the United Fruit Company. This purchased thousands of acres of land for plantations to grow bananas and other tropical fruits. In Venezuela and Colombia, we hold profitable drilling rights, and we even had profitable drilling rights in Mexico until 1917. In 1917, there's a revolution. The new government steps in, and according to Spanish law, the government can control subsurface resources. So they want to nationalize all the oil, which the American oil companies are infuriated about. They can't do this. Ah! They uh, demand that Coolidge send in troops. Instead, Coolidge sends down Dwight D. Morrow, an ambassador, who basically was able to prevent total 
uh, nationalization until the 1940s. And the American oil companies did get recompensed. Now, because here in Texas, we're also under Spanish law, who owns all the oil in Texas? The only state that owns all of its own land. We do. And if you have oil on your land, guess who owns that oil? You do. You do. Not all of us. You do. That's your oil. And um, the government, however, because we're Spanish law, the government can tell you how much of that oil you can pull out. For some reason, it's the Texas Railroad Commission. I have no idea why. But in 1920, they began to regulate how much oil you could pump out of the ground. So you get 50 barrels a month. Now, let's say you, oh, they can't do this to me, that's all my oil, and you pull out 150 barrels of oil a month. What's that going to do to the price of oil? Yeah, it's going to go down. You basically shot yourself in the foot. And basically, that's what happened in the 1920s, that we were pumping up too much oil. The government out in East Texas said, this is a new way we're going to regulate you guys. People tried to fight against it, so they sent out the Texas Rangers who had guns and shot people who were also trying to shoot back at them. America and the European community. Well, guys, uh, at, while World War I was shattering the established economies of Europe, the U.S. was climbing to unprecedented economic heights and we emerged as the world's largest creditor nation. After the war, we went to expand our exports or capture a lot of markets and restrict imports. So the Ford Me McCumber tariff is passed. Now, what's the Ford Me McCumber tariff? Guys, that basically raised tariff rates so high, they've never been that high before. Now, what's the problem with this? Let's say you're France. You need $500. And of course, it would be 500 million. But I'd let you say 500. To rebuild your factories and your infrastructure. Okay, I'll owe you that money. Then, I don't buy any of the goods that your factories are producing. So your tax money is way down. So, how are you going to pay me back for that loan I did? Or, I'll show you how, what they did in that. Even though France, Italy, and uh, England all came to America and said, Hey, um, remember all that money we borrowed during the war, Ally? Remember all that money, Ally? Um, why don't you just forgive us, okay? And Kulik said, Hey, you borrowed the money, didn't you? So it's like, son of a gun, what are we going to do? They are going to turn to Germany. Because under the Treaty of Versailles, Germany had to accept total blame for the war. And because they had to accept the total blame for the war, they also had to accept the total cost of the war. So if Germany could continue to pay back everybody, everything would be okay. Now, America apparently thought it was a good enough deal because we had about $4 billion of American investments over in Europe. I mean, GM bought Opel, which was Germany's largest auto producer. Ford, he built an incredibly huge automotive complex in England and in the USSR, or Russia. He built a tractor factory. Now guys, Germany though was in dire straits. After the uh, Kaiser, Kaiser Wilhelm, abdicated the throne, they got a new democratic government, the Weimar Republic. And it was in huge financial woes. I mean, its money was so worthless that it took you a wheelbarrow full of it to buy a loaf of bread. Well, by 1923, 
they couldn't make their war payments to either France or Belgium. So France and Belgium, they just invade the Ruhr Valley, which is an industrial zone right next to France's border. And they had their troops there and they said, we're not leaving until you pay back the money. And here's a poster that you see the German going, no, look, you can't get blood from a stone. I, I ain't got the money, honey. So what are we gonna do? Well, this is when Chicago banker Charles C. Dawes comes in with the Dawes plan. And this plan sounds totally wackadoo, but it worked. Basically, the US would loan Germany $2.5 billion. Germany would then use two billion of those dollars to pay back all the other European nations, the war debts. The other European nations then would turn around and pay the United States $2.5 billion. I mean, this seems just like you're robbing from Peter to pay Paul, but this whole crazy scheme actually worked until 1929, when the Depression buy buy extra money. And in this picture, you see these two kids and there's the wall. They got a rice mark that is so worthless. The guys basically was cheaper for you to wallpaper your rooms, your apartment, your house with rice marks than it was to go and buy wallpaper. Ready for the next slide? All right, disarmament treaty. Guys, basically, navies cost a lot of money to upkeep. And in 1921, Senator William E. Barat from Idaho suggested an international conference to set the size of navies. So they stopped just expanding and expanding. The government strongly supported this. And in November of 1921, Harding invited the major naval powers to Washington, D.C. Now, the U.S. and Britain had the world's largest navies, and like I said, they didn't want to have to keep growing it. The only problem with this, though, is Japan. Japan, new kid on the block, was spending one-third of its federal revenue building up the navy, which really was a threat to China, as well as the open-door policy that we were advocating, where everybody got a right to trade in China as well as other European nations' Asiatic possessions. So, um, at the Washington Naval Conference, Hughes called for pressures, when Hughes called for participants to scrap almost two million tons of warships. Now, most of these are mainly uh, battleships and other kind of capital ships a 10-year ban on naval construction, and they put limits the size of navies to the ratio of, for every five ships that England had, America could have five ships, Japan could have three, and Italy and France could both have 1.67 ships. Now, most of the public and even other nations agreed to this. Everybody except Japan. But we had already broken Japan's military code, so we kept. We knew that if we kept the pressure on, they relent. We keep the pressure on, they relent. Who knew? Well, guys, this was a huge victory. And um, when the conference ends on February 1922, nine treaties were signed amongst the nations. There'd be no capital ships for 10 years. It prohibited the use of poison gas. Um, and each other agreed not to attack one another's Asiatic per, uh, possessions. Indeed, the Nine Power Pact affirmed support for the sovereign and territorial boundaries of China and guaranteed commercial access to China. The only problem with this is smaller ships weren't discussed which at the 1930 uh, London Naval Conference that was addressed. And indeed, we're so excited about 
things that we can regulate. In 1923, Senator Barat introduced a resolution to outlaw war, which totally failed. But in the Kellogg-Brand Pact in 1928, it was signed by 15 nations, including Britain, France, Germany, uh, Italy, Japan, and the US, where each country renounced war as an instrument of national policy. And we agreed to settle our disputes by peaceful means. And eventually 64 nations signed this. So by the end of 1928, American independent internationalism appeared to be a success. You had American business investments and loans fueling an expansive world economy. Or we're trying to protect our Asian investments through agreements with Japan. The control of Latin America and the Caribbean was assured. Everything seemed promising. And then something happened. All right, the failure of prosperity. The 1928 election. Now, guys, the explosive news that hit in August of 1927 is that Coolidge said, oh, I'm not going to run. And everybody was like, what? You were doing so good. So instead, they chose the Secretary of Commerce, Herbert Hoover, to run. And in his acceptance speech, he stated, we in America today are near to the final triumph over poverty than ever before. The poorhouse is disappearing amongst us. Well, who did the Democrats pick? Well, this time, as a United Party, they picked Al Smith again of New York. And his opponents don't like uh, the fact that he's Catholic. They don't like his big city ways. They don't like his opposition to prohibition or his Tammany Hall connections. Tammany Hall was a huge corrupt political machine in New York City. I mean, they didn't even like his New York accent. So basically, um, evangelist Billy Sunday, Billy Sunday was kind of like Billy Graham, and that is such an old name from long ago, you kids wouldn't know, I know him, that's just because I was in the way back. But he was like an evangelist that would go to like stadiums and preach to these crowds, trying to win people over to Christ and everything like that. Well, Billy Sunday, was like his mentor. Same thing with Oral Roberts, who did the exact same thing. But basically, this very popular preacher, preacher Billy Sunday, called his supporters damnable whiskey politicians, bootleggers, cooks, crooks, pimps, and the businessmen who deal with them. Basically, the voters saw the hard work, Protestant small town values versus urban upheaval machine politics, foreigners, and the Catholic vote. Well, Hoover was able to win 58% of uh, the popular vote, and he wanted to be a very active president, bringing a new day for the American people. Now, what was he big on? He was big on associationalism, which is voluntary cooperation between two different group groups. For example, if you were a business owner and you were a union leader, God, hey, look, don't go on strike. Hey, hey, come on. Me, look, come to the government. We're going to talk this thing through. Everything's going to be cool. Competition, I mean, cooperation better than competition. That's what this whole associationalism was all. And then the role of the government was to help the two sides meet agreement. Now, the origins of the, the Depression. Everything seemed to be going well. Indeed, when Hoover entered office, uh, it seemed like we were getting ready to observe the final triumph over prosperity. 
Well, there's some problems with this. Our prosperity depended on a few key industries like construction, automobile manufacture, and consumer goods that were doing well. Other uh, sectors were barely making a profit like textiles, steel, and iron. And farming and mining were both operating at losses. Indeed, in the South and Midwest, from 1921 to 1928, you had more than 5,000 rural banks closed. We had surrounded ourselves kind of with this false wealth. So what was it really like in the trenches? Well, we kind of had a maldistribution of wealth and an overproduction of goods in the uh, factories. Indeed, from in 1929, the 513 uh, families here in America had annual incomes of more than a million dollars. And the top 5% controlled 60% of the nation's wealth. Now guys, I'm not going to, the goal of capitalism, if you want this to be your goal for your capitalism, is to try to make as much money as you can. And guys, there's nothing wrong with that. But what's the danger of the top 5% having 60% of the nation's wealth? You make all the choices. No, not only that, but if ever there's an economic hiccup, that 95% that only has 40% of the nation's wealth, they're not going to be able to kickstart the economy back up again. Because it's frozen up in that top 5%. So what was it like for the other 95%? Well, the economic realities, 70% of the American people were uh, living under an adequate wage of $2,500 a year. 80% of the families have no savings whatsoever. Well, how did they get all those goods? They had all those neat, shiny things. Guys, basically, they were living off credit. Now, like I told you in the last slide, you had way too much money and way too few hands. And the factories, because they had overproduced goods, Basically, they had to start laying off workers. Now, why did they just sell to foreign markets? Because, guys, we had passed that Holly Smoot tariff. And so, in reaction, other nations had passed high tariffs on our goods. So, to try and get the other nations to reduce their tariffs, Hoover lowered them by as much as 50%. But to no avail. Ready for the next slide? <laughs> um, by the way, guys, just on this again real quick, remember, when you go away to college, at that first week, everybody and their dog is going to get you to try to sign up for their credit cards. Again, do not lose your heads. Because they do that on purpose. Hey, we'll give you a free water bottle. So the kid's going to go out. All of a sudden, he's got access two thousand dollars that he can spend and ah, they go crazy buy all these new things and wind up in a lot of debt so watch now this credit stimulated economy was a boom to the stock market i mean you had stock prices rising with very little reflection on their actual worth like rca went from $95 a share to $178 a share in one year. GM went from $99 a share to $212 a share in three years. And it works as long as it continues to work. The only problem, though, is when you have things like Black Thursday rolling. What happened on Black Thursday? On Black Thursday, people just didn't want to buy it. 
there were not really new stocks being bought. So what starts happening to the value of the stocks? Starts to go down. Well, if you see that your stock is going down, you want to sell it while it's still high. But if there's no buyers, that just causes the value to plummet even further. Um, and then it used to take two hours for news about what was going on on Wall Street to get all the way from New York City to like San Francisco. As soon as they hear what's going on over on the West Coast, you have tons of people trying to sell. So at 12 o'clock, they close down the market. A bunch of New York businessmen get together and say, look, the people are losing their heads because the value of these stocks is going down. They say, all right, look, we need to buy up all this stuff just to level out the market. So when they get back at one, the market's reopen. They start buying. They start buying. The value of the stocks levels out. Everybody breathes a sigh. Friday, hey, it was okay. Weekend passes, market's not open, then Monday comes. Well, Monday morning was okay. But then all of a sudden, on Monday afternoon, started to dip down again. And then we have Black Tuesday. No, Black Tuesday. October 29th, where basically the market plunged. Uh, from September to mid-November of 19, I mean, uh, from, let's start that again. From September to mid-November, the New York Times Industrials fell from 469 points to 221, reaching only 58 points by mid-1932. The value of RCA stock fell from $101 down to only $28. Montgomery Wards, they fell from $139 down to only $59. You had hundreds of brokers and speculators that were totally ruined. Like, remember that, uh, let's take that RCA stock. And let's, instead of saying $101, let's say it was at $100. Well, I went to my broker and I bought 10 shares on margin, meaning I owe you $900. Well, that stock that I had for $100, now it's 28. I'm only gonna get 280 bucks if I sell all 10 stocks. And I don't have, what's $280, what is it, 620? $620 to give to you. I'm losing money. I can't pay you back. You basically lose your shirt because you owe the markets that money. You're out of business. I'm out of business. Oh, and it's not just us, the little guys. Corporations, instead of investing that money back into their company, well, they did invest it back into their company, but through buying stocks valued in the company because those things used to be going great and everything was wonderful till all of a sudden it's not. So you have people and businesses defaulting. They got no savings. Most of these guys have been dependent on their jobs uh, and installment payments to pay for their goods. That money isn't coming in anymore. So you have this whole beginning of a cycle of poverty. I mean, if your business was, oh, wrong way, wrong way. No, no, no. Internationally, when America sneezes, the world catches a cold. Europe, they, their, their bottom is pulled out from under them, but they didn't really want to buy American goods anyway. And indeed, in 1932, American exports fell to the lowest level since 1905. From 1929 to 1932, more than 90,000 businesses failed. The ones that do survive, their profits are down 60%. More than 9,000 banks closed, where the depositors lose $2.5 billion. Now, guys, why do we care so much about the banks? You know, I remember the, the last little economic hiccup we had. You know, it started very into bushes and then it went through Obama and everything like that. Uh, I remember the, you had people getting thrown out of their homes. People that couldn't feed 
nuclear failings. What does the government fight to do? Save the banks. That's so mean. No, it's not. Huh? Why is it not mean to save the banks? Why do we need banks? Well, let's say you have a great idea. What do you want your idea to be? Because like, let's say I save your, I give you $50 worth of food. I gave you a fish. Give a man a fish, give him a meal. Teach a man to fish, give him many meals. So I save the bank. How is saving the bank giving you many meals? You're a smart girl. You come up with a revolutionary idea of a new software system uh, for the, like that one lady that totally fooled everybody into believing the little Edison, I think it was, that from one little blood drop could run all these tests on it. Well, you actually figure out one that works, and you know it'll work. So where do you go to start? You don't have the money to start your business. Where do you go? You go to a bank. She shows them the business plan. Bank then provides you with the money. Well, you need people to help you out. You gotta hire a program. You gotta hire her company to transport the thing and deliver it all across the United States. You gotta hire him to help construct it. You gotta hire her to help. So you are creating jobs. And all these jobs are giving you more money and you're able to pay back the bank. And now she can feed her family and stay in her house. She can feed her family, same, same, same. So you say the banks because the banks are these kind of centers of capital. Well, like I told you, things are bad. The purchase of new autos goes down 70%. About the only thing that is doing good is unemployment. It was at 3% uh, in 1929. Shoots up to 9% in 1930. And by 1933, it's up to 25%. One out of every four. And when you count that three out of every four women wasn't in the workforce, uh, those unemployment numbers for kind of our generation would actually seem a lot higher. <coughs> Did y'all ever hear my joke about unemployment? That didn't work. Ah, see what I did there? You're working on other things. Professor Galloway is the best person. <gasps> that is so stupid. <laughs> so the government and the economic crisis. Now guys, initially, they thought the drop in the stock market was a good thing. Why? Well, we had all those elevated prices, and now it's more like it's real, so it's good. Kind of like I remember when we had the economic hiccup and, uh, you know, Obama just gets into office. I remember watching Good Morning America and you had families that were losing their jobs. Meanwhile, in Good Morning America, they said, oh, it's a good thing because we're learning to do more with less. Yeah. Um, and you know, they had one interview where it was a guy who was pulling down a three-figure fig three salary being a broker on Wall Street. The guy's 61. He loses his job. So he has to take a job as a barista at Starbucks. And he's in there going, this is the best job I've ever had. I like it so much more than selling stocks. Okay, this is basically where we're going to have to pick up because it's where the slides, even though we did talk about some of this stuff. Herbert's early policy, basically, because it was all about associationalism, he went to the leaders of business and unions to try to get the businesses, hey, don't fire everybody. Even if the business only needed like eight hours of work, instead of firing one guy, uh, give two guys four hours of work each. Let them do four-hour shifts. That way, at least they have, you know, more people have a little money. And Ford actually listened to that. He lowered taxes and interest rates to try to get more people to invest. 
and also uh, kind of goes with the trickle-down theory that uh, that money would eventually get to more people. Also, he uh, went to Congress, both Congress as well as state governments, and pled with them to do more uh, public works projects. And then they built like highways, government facilities, Boulder Dam. Indeed, the federal government increased its public spending and more than doubled it. But the economy still worsened and people still blamed them. By the end of 1932, in workers' incomes had fallen 40%. Unemployment was at 25%. And of course, small towns were hit the hardest, like Denora, Pennsylvania. It had 277 jobs for a population of 14,000. You know, you had people that uh, lost their homes, basically, you know, were homeless, would ride on the rail cars, empty rail cars, developing kind of a coyote mentality to survive. Now, private charities did try to help out with like soup lines, but eventually you run out of soup. Thank you. Yeah, people throwing together uh, pieces of construction material, making shanty towns that were called Hoovervilles. At night, if you were really cold, you might wrap yourself up in a Hoover blanket, and that's a newspaper. And if you were really kicking in style, you might have a Hoover car, which is a horse-drawn wagon, or they actually even hooked up horses to cars. Because you didn't have the money to pay for gasoline, but you still had the car. Now, farmers, of course, as always, are really hit hard, especially when the subsidy of buying wheat at 80 cents a bushel runs out. The reason why that uh, subsidy ran out is because the Farm Bureau just ran out of money. A third of all farm households were in bankruptcy. Of course, in places like South Dakota, it's 60% of the farms. And when your land is foreclosed upon, basically the families are thrown out. This was made even worse by the fact that no crops were being planted in these empty, barren fields. You had soil lost to wind erosion. Basically, the dust bowl, you'd have dust clouds seven to 8,000 feet high, 200 miles across, that were sweeping across the plain making it seem like it was near midnight if you were covered by one of those dust clouds. And when it left, there was dust everywhere. Indeed, by 1938, we had lost more than 850 million acres of topsoil due to this erosion. Well, the farmers, they take their frustration to action. A guy by the name of Milo Reno formed the Farmers Holiday Association in 1932. And basically, he called upon farmers to destroy their products and to resist foreclosures. He said, when you take a man's horse and his plow away, you deny him food. You just convicted his family to starvation. He organized farmers, armed them, and they'd go to the farm auctions after the bank had foreclosed upon the owners. They'd make sure that nobody else bid on the items that were up for auction, uh, except for the former owners of the stuff. So basically the former owners were able to buy up their stuff for like pennies on the dollar. Well, by December 1931, Hoover gave in to public pressure and began to create government agencies to study unemployment and reform the banking system. He started like the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, 
that provided emergency funding for banks, life insurance companies, the railroads, and farm mortgage associations. Now, once again, why are banks so important? When people are starving and getting thrown out of their homes, why are we saving the banks? You remember? Why, why do they save the banks? Well, the banks have the money. So if you have an idea for a business, you gotta go to the bank to get a loan. And if that, you start that business, you gotta hire people to make that business work. So more wealth is generated, et cetera. And the reason, of course, why I gave money to like the railroads is the same reason why today we give money to the airlines or to auto companies, not only because they're huge businesses that have a lot of employees underneath them, but also they demand a lot of resources. So they also have to pay a lot of other companies to help them out and do things. The Glass Stingle Act was passed to put more money into the system and the Federal Home Loan uh, Bank Act allowed homeowners to have lower mortgages. Now why do you think they wanted to keep people in houses? What is the important thing about having a house as compared to living in an apartment? Well, why do you buy a house? Huh? Well, why would you like buy a house in up in Melissa or in McKinney instead of um, down in South Dallas or East Dallas? Well, not East Dallas, West Dallas. No, but the reason why we buy houses, I'll tell you this, two years ago, all the home values in Plano went up 15%. Why? Because, because Plano moved here, because State Farm moved here, all the jobs, and people needed houses. And they like living in Plano. And basically, a home is an investment. You want it to increase in value. So, uh, so you're going to mow the yard. Well, if you're going to mow the yard, then you need to go buy a lawnmower. So you support a lawn mowing business and it might be electric and that way you're supporting the electric company it might be gas that way you're supporting the convenience store every time you have to go buy a gallon for it basically because your home is an investment you have to keep it looking nice if something breaks you got to fix it that's more money that goes into the local economy and of course at the end of the day the tax the property taxes at least here in Texas on your home go to help pay for your schooling. Basically, <coughs> ah, get a drink. Basically, what Hoover wanted was trickle-down economics. In other words, the guys at the top get the money and eventually it's going to go down and filter down to the little guys. Well, is this enough for his opponents? No. They want direct relief. Um, so you have uh, Hoover uh, totally opposed this. He felt that private organizations and local governments should be the ones to give the money. However, he did finally bring the Emergency Relief Division, which provided more than $300 million to the states. But the trick was, the states had to borrow that money. And a lot of states didn't want to go into further debt by taking out a loan. Like West Virginia, they took out a $9 million loan to help their poor. Well, how did it help the poor? Basically, it gave every poor family in West Virginia just 10 bucks. And they had to raise taxes to pay back the um, loan. Meanwhile, you have, um, by the summer of 1932, the farmer's holiday movement is spreading, and you have a new threat called the Bonus Army, where 20,000 veterans basically marched on Washington, D.C. to get an early uh, payment 
of kind of a retirement bonus that the government was going to give them. Well, while they were there, Hoover made sure that they had tents, made sure they had clothing, made sure they had food and medicine. While Congress was deliberating what to do with the uh, bonus, and Congress decides, no, nope, we're not going to give it to you. Uh, you got to wait till the due date. So they were ordered to disperse. About 10,000 veterans did leave, but 10,000 stayed. And because 10,000 stayed, basically the army was called out to evict the 10,000 soldiers that were still there. So the army underneath uh, General Douglas MacArthur, basically using sabers, rifles, bayonets, tear gas, uh, forced the um, veterans out, uh, wounding more than 100 of them. And of course, some uh, people blamed Hoover, and he said, hey, it wasn't my fault. There were communist agitators. Ready? All right, the diplomacy of the depression. What's going on internationally? Well, basically in Latin America uh, and the Caribbean, Hoover, who had promised to withdraw our troops, continues to withdraw them, basically telling American companies that they were kind of on their own. This made the respect for America and Latin America go up. In Europe, well, everybody over there blamed us for the depression anyway. And the high tariffs that we had against European goods way back under the Holly Smooth era. And in Asia, in Asia you had kind of a militant, nationalistic government that kind of moved in, and Japan is a very resource poor island. They don't have a lot of natural resources in Japan. So they hungrily looked towards the Chinese province of Manchuria that was rich in coal as well as rice. And basically in September of 1931, what they did is they got some of their soldiers, dressed them up in Chinese uniforms, and the soldiers planted bombs on a Japanese-owned railway on one of their bridges. And basically, they blew up the bridge. And then they blamed China for doing this. And this basically leads to conflict with Chiang Kai-shek, who was the president of the leader of China. And they basically go to war. Other nations of the world, they protest, but they don't do anything. So by September of 1933, Japan realizes that the League of Nations is nothing but a paper tiger, and they get out of it and start building up their navy big time and army. Ready for the next slide? All right, Depression America. Well, guys, this was something that touched every life in America, uh, forcing changes in lifestyle, in thought, in politics. I mean, poverty is no longer limited to the lazy or unworthy or the remote areas of the inner cities. It could happen to you or your brother, sister, mom, dad, children. Families in the Depression, annual incomes dropped 35% from 1929 to 1933, from $2,300 a year down to only $1,500 a year. Some newspapers began to print out uh, depression recipes that would allow you to feed a family of five on only like $8 a week. Problem was, a lot of people don't have even $8 a week. Nationally, the average for relief or welfare was only $4.20 a week. And in New York City, because they had so many poor and times were so strapped, they only paid $2.30 a week. 
Indeed, Groucho Marx joked that he knew things were bad when he saw the pigeons feeding the people in Central Park. Well, who are we supposed to blame for this economic debacle? Well, they blamed uh, our lack of morals. You know, during the 1920s, girls were wearing shorter skirts. Uh, they were smoking um, those darn flappers. We forgot our way. We got our eyes off God's goal for America. Well, actually, during this time, uh, the majority of Americans clung to family values. I mean, divorces went down. Uh, young people put off getting married until later. So the middle and working classes in hard times. Now, the most common fear was economic insecurity. You know, how long would my job last? Some people saw their businesses go bankrupt, like uh, future president Harry S. Truman. He had a men's haberdashery or clothiers that had to shut its doors and he had to change careers. That's when he got into politics. Some people began companies out of their own homes, like beauty parlors, uh, bakeries. They might offer boarding. For example, one Milwaukee wife, uh, she basically opened up a bakery out of her kitchen. If you wanted a loaf of bread, it would cost you nine cents. If you wanted an apple pie, it would cost you 25 cents. Well, a health inspector for the city came out to inspect her kitchen, and of course, it didn't pass health codes. So the health inspector says, I'm gonna shut you down. And she says, hey, look, if you shut me down, I'm gonna have to go on relief. So they went ahead and they let her stay open. And she earned that $65 a month. Use it up, wear it out, make it do or do without kind of became a mantra for a lot of people. You had people sewing, baking their own bread, canning vegetables to make them last longer. Indeed, the flour and seed bags back then, basically they were reused to make clothing. Not only for children, but for people as well. And what was kind of interesting is the flower bags knew what people were doing. So some of the flower bag companies would put an example. They would print on the inside of the flower bag. They'd print a pattern in there so that the clothes could look pretty. And on the outside of the bag, they'd show, hey, this is what the pattern on the inside of the bag looks like. So you could say, oh, that would make a pretty dress for my daughter. That would make a nice shirt for my husband or son. Boy, I like that pattern there. Ready for the next one? What else did they do? Well, they began their own vegetable gardens. Maybe they go to local parks for entertainment or libraries. But the thing I love despite this, you still had 65% of families that still hit away 10 cents a week so they could go see the movies. Now, what were the movies about? The movies, the top movies during this time were like romantic comedies where a rich guy or girl fell in love with a poor guy or girl. You could play a brand new board game where you made or lost millions in real estate in Atlantic City, New Jersey. This game was called Monopoly. And do you realize that Parker Brothers is the only company that can make Monopoly? So they kind of like have a monopoly on Monopoly. Ah, something to think about. And one out of every six families had to double up Meaning that, you know, hey, if your brother loses his job, then basically you'd open up your home and him and his wife and their kids would all come in and live. You have more than one family living in a house, uh, home. Ready for the next one? All right, in rural areas, it's even more difficult because there's even more, less opportunity. You had thousands that flee like Arkansas, Oklahoma, 
and even some areas of Texas. They were known as the Okies or the Arkies. Where were they going? They were heading out to California, where there's supposed to be jobs of plenty, picking crops. Well, it turned out to be false. And the story of one of these families, it's a fictitious story, but it's based on true things uh, about the Joads and their journey out to California is John Steinbeck's The Grapes of Wrath. Really, really good story. If ever you feel like really bad, just open that book, start reading the story, and you're like, wow, I thought I would have had it bad. Now, discrimination in the Depression. African-Americans are continuing to leave the South for northern urban centers. And, of course, racial violence does break out, especially when there's competition for the same jobs. Now, there were cases of injustice like the Scottsboro Nine, which were nine uh, black men that were in a box, empty boxcar on a train. Basically, they were hobos. Uh, and two white women uh, accused them of um, molestation and rape. And even though one of the girls recanted her story, uh, eight of these guys were sentenced to death. And it kept on being appealed. Appealed goes through that process. Finally, by 1950, the Supreme Court found them not guilty and ordered all of them released. Their unemployment rates were usually 20 to 50% higher than other populations. Well, what about Latino Americans? Well, they also faced discrimination. They were fired to give jobs to whites in the Southwest. Like in Tucson, Arizona, Mexicans were accused of taking the bread out of our white children's mouths. But Orange County, California, was, I guess, kind of progressive because it gave free transportation to more than 2,000 Mexican-Americans. It shipped them back to Mexico, basically to reduce their numbers that were on relief. Who's next? Well, Asian Americans. One out of every six uh, Asian was on relief. But they received 10 to 20% less than all other families. And the reason why the government did this is because they said, well, they're smaller, they don't eat as much. So they don't need as much. And of course, to fight against uh, threat, other threats, you had the Japanese American Citizens League rise up to protect uh, legal rights. Women they also faced uh, discrimination. Uh, they had lower salaries than the men did, even though they were less likely to be laid off in labor position. However, if they had a professional position, like being a teacher, uh, their numbers declined. They went from 14% of the teachers down to just uh, 12%. Why? Because most people, including women, believe that men should get the first pick of the jobs. Why? Because this was back in a day when you only had one spouse working. Companies wouldn't hire married women. And 63% of uh, women who later on got married were fired. And rural women had it even more difficult because they didn't have the domestic service opportunities that the women in the city did. 
being like maids or a laundress. Indeed, this here is a famous picture of a half Cherokee woman during the Depression and her three kids, and it was taken by a woman. Well, who's going to save us? The guy who's going to save us is the, a very unlikely hero, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. This was a guy that was born into wealth and privilege. His family was incredibly wealthy. He himself went to Harvard, then on to Columbia Law School. He was the fifth cousin of Teddy Roosevelt. Even though uh, Teddy Roosevelt, they were the Dutch Roosevelt's and Franklin's family was the English side. After graduating from uh, Columbia Law School, he decides to run for the New York State Legislature in 1910, winning his seat where, of course, he was incredibly charismatic. He was tall, handsome, charming, glib. He would work with anybody, including Tammany Hall connections, in order to get things done. And he moved up the political ladder very quickly, so much so that in 1920, James Cox made him his running mate. So uh, the nation got to know who Franklin Delano Roosevelt was. And even though Cox lost, everybody got to know who Roosevelt was. But then, something happened. In 1921, Franklin Delano Roosevelt contracted polio. And guys, kind of like we're so scared today about COVID, we wear masks. Back then, they had no idea what caused polio. And I mean, it was a disease that could paralyze you, it was a disease you could die from. Indeed, my grandfather had uh, polio, and um, his brother had to quit the high school baseball team to come home and massage uh, my grandfather's legs for an hour, so they wouldn't the muscles wouldn't atrophy. Indeed, they were so worried about it that. His parents, in an attempt to save his life and make sure he wouldn't die, they agreed to a radical surgery. And I won't tell you what they did, but because of the things that they cut off, there's a reason that both my father and my aunt, their two kids, had to be adopted. Um, he was paralyzed from the waist down. He worked hard to overcome it. Uh, diligently, he refused to become the forgotten man. Finally, using heavy steel leg uh, braces and crutches, he was able to stand up and shuffle around a bit. Indeed, oh, and uh, his wife, Eleanor, also worked ceaselessly to get him walking again. And he did not want anyone to know that he had to get around in a wheelchair. Why do you think he didn't want anybody to know? What, why do you think uh, Franklin Roosevelt didn't want people to know he had to have a wheelchair? Well, remember, he's a politician. Yeah, because maybe it would seem like weakness or something, you know? Um, indeed, when his, um, there's a statue uh, as a memorial to him in Washington, D.C., and when it was unveiled in 2008, it showed Franklin Roosevelt in a wheelchair, which a lot of people thought was wrong because he fought so hard to keep people from knowing that. Now, of course, on the flip side, a lot of people also thought it was great. Uh, anyway, in 1928, he runs for governor of New York, and he becomes the governor. And he starts using, uh, he starts paying directly uh, 
uh, using New York State's finances to assist the poor and unemployed. So he's given direct aid. And now, of course, some of this was payment for, you know, hey, they have to have a job like planting trees or something like that. And um, did, did the fact that the state government was giving away money like this, did it end the depression in New York? Did it end the depression in New York State? No. Well, why didn't he do it then? Well, we kind of had something like that. I mean, we're lucky because I'm a professional and you have parents that are professionals, so they have jobs. But there's a lot of people that don't have jobs. And what has the government done during this COVID crisis that might be like that? Yeah, what has the government done? Like we talked about Roosevelt doing the direct aid. Did our government give any direct aid during the COVID crisis? Um, the well, the stimulus checks. That's exactly what it is. Even though you're sitting there going, wait a minute, this is my money you're giving back to me. And I know that I'm going to have to be paying it back. Within, but why did the government do that? Yeah, to help, because unlike you and me, some people were totally ruined by this. You know, because they were closing down all the businesses, restricting and limitations. And it seemed like he was doing something. So the election of 1932. Basically, Roosevelt was nominated at the Democratic National Convention. He was uh, nominated over more experienced politicians like Al Smith of New York and Texan Jack Garner. And Roosevelt totally breaks with tradition and he flies out to the convention that's in Chicago to accept the nomination. And in his acceptance speech, he promised a new deal for the American people, which the press just loved. And they started calling it the New Deal. To unite the party, Roosevelt chose Garner, Texan Garner, Jack Garner, as his running mate. What was he for? He supported a direct relief and a balanced budget. So this whole election comes down to a contest between two philosophies of government. You know, how much should the government be involved? Roosevelt relied on his biggest assets, his energy and contagious optimism. And the election was a huge success for the Democratic Party as they swept state and local offices. Even though it says Roosevelt won by a landslide, if you look at the popular vote, he really only won 57% of the popular vote, but he totally walked away with it with the electoral vote. I mean, Hoover only won six states. Promise me you won't cry? Is that? Huh? Is that? Say for me.